Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for a discussion between Johan Hari, whose new book, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention, and How to Think Deeply Again, was just published by Crown last week, and the esteemed Naomi Klein. I'm Abby Wright, Creative Development Lead for the Content Marketing Team at Penguin Random House. We are so excited to hear from Johan and Naomi, but before we begin, we just have a few notes to go over. You are welcome and encouraged to respectfully connect with other readers in the chat, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'd love to hear your thoughts and excitement for this event. We will also be providing links to the book and Johan's social accounts and email. Please also submit your questions as they come up in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you've already pre-submitted questions in the sign-up form, no need to resubmit. I have them. If you would like to turn on closed captions for the event, please click live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Please note these captions are auto-generated, so they may not be 100% perfect, but we will try our best. First, a bit about our speakers today. Johan Hari is a writer and journalist. He has written for the New York Times, Le Monde, The Guardian, and other newspapers. His TED Talks have been viewed over 70 million times, and his work has been praised by a broad range of people, from Oprah Winfrey to Noam Chomsky to Joe Rogan. Joining Johan in conversation is the esteemed Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein is an award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author. She is senior correspondent for The Intercept, a Puffin Writing Fellow at Type Media Center. From 2018 to 2021, she was the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair at Rutgers University and is now Honorary Professor of Media and Climate at Rutgers. In September 2021, she joined the University of British Columbia as UBC Professor of Climate Justice. I will join you again in a bit for the Q&A portion, but for now, I'm pleased to welcome Johan Hari and Naomi Klein to this virtual stage. Cheers, Abby. Thanks so much. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Johan. It's this is so the first time we've done a public event since you became a professor, like a really fancy <laughs> professor. So I now feel like I need to be extra deferential to you. Oh, dear. It's great <laughs> to see you, Johan. I wish we were in person. It's true. Oh. We have done book events together in Toronto in person. Um, but this is it's just such always such a pleasure to be able to think with you and to hear all of your considered uh, conclusions after a long, deep journey. Uh, and you have made a long, deep journey in, um, in writing and researching this incredibly important book, Stolen Focus. It's a very generous book, and I want to thank you for that. Um, it's very generous to your readers, very empathetic. Um, and it's one of the things I really love about your writing um, I often joke with you that that your books are they're they're, they're a Trojan horse um, <laughs> using a kind of a format of self help which tends to sort of blame the reader and <laughs> um, and while offering help which we all need and tips and advice also um, being very clear that the issues that you tackle whether it's addiction or depression or our fractured attention are not all of our faults and are part of a, a, a of a system crisis in which we find ourselves um, and that ultimately uh, it's collective help that we need uh, it, it's it's the work of really of, of movements so Thank you for that. Thank you for that generosity and that empathy, um, which I think is really what draws so many of us to your work, because it makes us feel like we're part of a broader community of people who are struggling with these huge issues. So I want to start by asking you to, um, to talk about the relationship between attention or lack thereof 
um, and fear and panic. Um, because I think things have gotten so much worse during the pandemic. And that's very much related to this intersection between panic and fractured attention. And on the flip side, the relationship between calm and focus. Yeah, that's such a good place to start. I just want to say before I do that, you know, you and I have been talking about this subject, I think, for 10 years, one way or another. And I, I can't imagine what my work would be like if I had never read No Logo, The Shock Doctrine, or This Changes Everything. And I think particularly This Changes Everything, the, the, the kind of, almost like the shape, the grammar of the thinking of This Changes Everything really changed how I think, actually. And I think, uh, I, you know, I don't think I could have written these books if it weren't for the example that you've given. And, uh, you know, my books are like a hundredth as good as yours, but the, and I, and I particularly think there was a conversation that you and I had when I had written the first draft of this book that completely changed the book. And it was something you said to me, I'm sure we'll come to this later, but, but so this book, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really in your debt and I'm really grateful to you. In terms of uh, stress and, and panic and what they do to attention, it's interesting. I remember at the start of the pandemic, those of us who were not doing the heroic work of emergency work or the things that had to carry on, people who knew they were going to be locked away for a while. I remember loads of people saying, oh, I'm going to finally read War and Peace. I'm going to, I'm going to learn French on Duolingo. And everyone will have noticed no one read Tolstoy and no one learned French, right? In fact, people Googling, how do I get my brain to work, increased by more than 300%. <clears throat> and I think I was unusually well prepared for understanding why because of some of the research I'd done about stress and how it affects attention. And I remember particularly, there's a heroic woman called Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who, who subsequently has become the Surgeon General of California. Um, she wasn't when I interviewed her, but so she explained to me one day, this is a stress, this is before the pandemic, so she wasn't talking explicitly about COVID. But she said, imagine if one day, out of the blue, you were attacked by a bear and you survived. In the weeks and months that followed, something totally involuntary would happen to your attention. Um, you would find it harder to focus on immediate things like reading a book, deeper things like reading a book, because a big part of your mind is just gonna be scanning for danger, right? You, something came out of the blue and attacked you, so you're gonna be scanning for what else could come out of the blue and attack me. Okay, now imagine you were attacked by a bear again. It's a very unlucky scenario, but imagine it. You would likely flip into a scenario, into a state called hypervigilance, which is where you really can't focus on things, things like, you know, reading a book or something, because so much of your mind is, is geared towards danger and risk. We know that traumatized children, for example, live in a state of hypervigilance. And I remember there's a doctor I interviewed in Adelaide in Australia called Dr. John Giardini, who really helped me to understand this. He said, look, deep focus is a really good strategy when you're safe, right? Read a book, you'll grow, you'll become a better person. Deep strategy is a really, a deep focus is a really dumb strategy if you're in danger. You'd be a fool to sit at the Battle of the Somme reading a novel, right? You're not going to be around very long. That we evolved to be able to pay attention, deep focus, when we feel safe. When you don't feel safe, your attention, it's not that you're not paying attention, but your attention is focused on risk, detecting risk. And so I think the pandemic partly, you know, we are in fact surrounded by risk, right? There's the virus. There's also the way the virus upended our lives and our sense of the future, who we are. There's a lot of economic risk in that, uh, a lot of social risk. We're afraid of ourselves and the people we love. But I, I also think there's a deeper layer there. I'm curious about what you think about this, Naomi, and that the, you, you're obviously doing a lot of work at the moment for reasons we're not allowed to talk about, although I'm dying to, about conspiracy. What, what, what do you think about what it's done to our psychology? Well, I, I think that it has a lot to do with um, it. I think I think there's I think we are most panicked when we lack a narrative. I think I think and this is mm. this is why I think 
your books are so helpful because they're very tightly structured and you know one feels that that we are in good hands and that somebody has thought things through and so you can sort of sink into that and if you think about the experience of the pandemic right it's 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 not just that it's bad and hard it's that it's something really quite new you know i've never lived through a global pandemic before i don't think you have either um and and so we are we're in uncharted territories. Um, you know, not to say there haven't been pandemics before, but not in a such a network society. And then, in addition to the pandemic, we're dealing with the economic crises, we're dealing with climate crises, um, and we're dealing with an information ecology that is serving us so poorly. And so, it's the I think you know the the state of shock. And that makes us malleable, right? And, and whether we're malleable, if we think about malleable to sort of uh, authoritarian narratives that come in and say, well, you're either with us or you're against us, or the conspiratorial narratives that say, oh no, the pandemic isn't even what they're telling you it is, it's this completely other thing. The, the appeal is like someone has a story, right? We don't have a story. Mm -hmm. And we be, and, 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 and I think we're most panicked, least calm when we lack narrative. Um, and, and, and I think, frankly, social media, and this is, you know, your work, I, I, what I've always found most destabilizing about social media is that it scrambles the narrative impulse. You're reading totally disconnected things, mm -hmm. right? Whereas when you're reading a book, someone has put a lot of thought into how it's ordered, right? Um, and when you are reading a social media feed, when you're reading Twitter, your brain is trying to make connections but there are no connections. It's just some algorithm that's serving up the things that 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 Twitter has decided you will most engage you, um, and that further destabilizes us. Yeah. Um, so, that's so interesting. Yeah. That's so just thinking a few, about what, a few what of the saying. things. That's so fascinating because do you know um, that line the poet Muriel Reichsmeyer said, um, "The world is not made of atoms. The world is made of stories," and that that that's so interesting about when when we either when we don't have a narrative or when we have the, the wrong narrative. Um, so I think about at the start of doing the research, I remember talking to you about this very early when I was still thinking of even, I hadn't even begun writing the book or anything. The stories I had in my head about why I couldn't pay attention were basically, I'm lacking willpower. I'm not strong enough. I'm not good enough. And someone invented the smartphone and screwed me over. And I remember having this moment very early in the research, which really challenged one of those stories, because I thought, OK, so the story is I don't have enough willpower. I've got to get my willpower back. So I went to interview Professor Roy Baumeister, who's at the University of Queensland, who's literally the leading expert on willpower in the world. He's been researching this for 35 years. For everyone watching probably has heard of the marshmallow test. He's the guy who invented that. He wrote a book called Willpower, right? <laughs> so I go to interview him and I said something like, you know, I'm thinking, uh, struggle you know I'm thinking of writing a book about why people are struggling to pay attention and I'm going to remember the not remember the words exactly right they're in the book but he's just saying like oh it's interesting you say that because I've just noticed yeah my attention isn't very good anymore I just play video games on my phone all the time and he's talking right to this and I'm, and I'm sort of sitting there I'm like wait aren't you the leading expert on willpower in the world didn't you write a book called Willpower and you're telling me you just play Candy Crush all day? It was like the moment at the end of Invasion of the Body Snatchers where they realized, oh, everyone's been body snatched, right? It's like they're all aliens. Um, and it was this really chilling moment because I later discovered, of course, this story about individual failure um, it is, it is, is so wrong, right? Not that, of course, we can individually fail, of course, and there are things we can individually do, but you realize how, how deep in the grammar of the, this culture, particularly American culture, but Western culture, the idea that if there's a problem, it must be located in the individual and the individual's failures. And I think about this, we talked about this in relation to depression as well. There, you know, when I was a child, Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals and their families. And I never liked Margaret Thatcher, but I realized how much I took that on, that grammar of how, of thinking so shapes everyone. So when a problem comes along, addiction, depression, the inability to focus, absolutely reflexively, we, we blame ourselves. And you've always been so much better than I, I, I will ever be you, at thinking systemically, right? That, that you, 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 I'm curious about that because you, you've always had the ability to see, oh, these, these are big systemic problems, haven't you? 
Um, well, I think, yeah, but that doesn't make it easier, <laughs> maybe. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> understanding it's a systemic problem um, and being able to resist it, there isn't really a yeah. relationship between the two. We are up against such huge forces. What I would say, we're just thinking about, about why this period has been so challenging for people's attention is that we, we are creatures of narrative. And when we encounter something new and unfamiliar, our impulse is to make meaning together, is to narrativize what we've experienced, mm. right? So if you think about after September 11th in New York, people were just kind of spontaneously gathering in, you know, in Times Square, I mean, like places where you wouldn't, where, where there aren't usually deep conversations, right? Um, but people had this impulse of, of, of you know, there, this sort of, it felt like a bolt out of the blue. It wasn't, but it, it but but it felt that way. And there needed to be this um, meaning making, right? This is why you know Noam Chomsky's books started flying off the shelf because Noam Chomsky had a story that put the event in historical context. People were so hungry for that. And then you know we had uh, George W. Bush at the time saying, "Go shopping, do the most atomizing thing you can do," which is the exact opposite of what people knew they needed to do, which is gather, make meaning, read history, get grounded. And I think the thing that has just been so hard on everyone, and why every, we should all cut ourselves some slack, and but also figure out what to do about it, is that the nature of this particular shock, this particular event that needed meaning making meant that we had to be atomized, right? And mm -hmm. so the desire to be connected expressed itself through social media. Be, and it came out of that impulse, that same impulse that, 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 that drove people into squares and <laughs> reaching for their Noam Chomsky after 9-11. But in this case, we ended up with this sort of cacophony of voices telling us, sc further scrambling our brains, right? Instead of that mm. kind of narrative. And social media is terrible at, at, at making narratives. It, it, it's great at just getting us, you know, you know, voicing our opinion, but that is very different. Or you get these weird sort of 360 narratives that sort of the QAnon world is offering, um, where it's claiming to explain absolutely everything under the sun. Um, and, and, that, and I think that, that there's a strange tension between being able to, ha to handle no narrative <laughs> and claiming mm. to have understood absolutely everything throughout time. Uh, and that yeah. That's so interesting. So, so, but let's, let's talk more about systems because um, I think what this book brings so much clarity uh, to is, is that ultimately we're talking about a business model. Um, and, and it reminds me a bit of, of, of the climate crisis as well, that, you know, the fossil fuel companies have a business model that is at odds with what we need to do in the, in the face of the climate crisis. And social media companies have a business model that is at odds with what we need to do in the face of an attention crisis. So I'd love to hear you talk more about what we do when confronted with business models um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that have produced entrenched interests, right? Like these are the most profitable companies in the history of capitalism now. It used to be fossil fuel companies, but now it's Apple and Facebook and Google. Um, so we, how do we build power to confront that kind of power? Yeah, that, that's so important. And it's funny because this, this reminds me of the conversation we had at the end of having written the first draft of the book. So I wrote this first draft of the book where it was much shorter, partly because I had it in my head I want to write a book for people who can't pay attention it's going to have to be short and I wrote this draft that I I had to write but even as I was writing it I thought there's something really wrong here so I was describing the individual changes I made including this very dramatic experiment where I went away for three months without the internet um, and all these individual changes I made in my life and I didn't talk about this collective layer and I just felt so uneasy. And I remember I phoned you and we had this really long conversation. And I just realized that what I had written, not consciously, but it was inauthentic because I was, what, it's, not, it's not what I was saying wasn't true. It's true that our things we can do as isolated individuals that will get us, you know, 10, 20% of the way to better attention. That's definitely worth doing. I'm passionately in favor of those things. But I also just realized it's absurd to only talk about that. It's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day and then they're leaning forward and going, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate. Then you wouldn't scratch so much. 
And it's like, okay, I'll learn to meditate, but you need to stop pouring the inching powder on me. And it's interesting because of the 12 factors that are degrading our focus and attention that I write about in the book, obviously the, the tech that we have is, is one of them. But in a way I felt quite encouraged because before I did this research, I, I, this was framed and this is exactly how big tech wants us to think about it. In my head, the debate was, well, are you pro-tech or anti-tech, right? And of course I ran away from the tech. So I was like, oh, I've become anti-tech, right? And that just leaves you feeling hopeless because we're not going to become the Amish, right? Nor should we. We're not going to abandon our technologies. No disrespect to any Amish people who are cheating and watching this video. I can't imagine there's many of them. Um, we're not going to do that. So then you get into this fatalism. Oh, I must be pro-tech. I must just consent to all of this model. But the truth is we can have, the question is not, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? The question is what tech designed for what purposes working in whose interests? So everyone watching you know if you open facebook now or tiktok or whatever it is you know they start to make money every second you keep it open and you scroll and every time you close those apps those revenue streams disappear that's their business model right it's a sean parker one of the biggest initial investors in facebook put it um we designed it to maximally invade people's attention we knew what we were doing and we did it anyway god only knows what it's doing to our children's brains that's what he said um, we now know the leaked documents from Facebook. They know they're also destroying our collective attention. They know that. Um, and so the business model is literally just built around one thing, right? All this algorithmic genius, all this engineering power, all these very clever people in Silicon Valley are figuring out one thing. How do we get you to pick up your phone as often as possible? How do we get you to scroll as long as possible? How do we get your kids to pick up their phone as, as often as possible? How do we get your kids to scroll as long as possible? That's it. Just like the head of KFC wants you to eat fried chicken. These companies, and that's all he cares about. All these companies care about is maximizing your scrolling. So obviously they've discovered dozens and dozens of techniques, hundreds of techniques to keep us doing that. Some of which have disastrous effects for your individual attention. And some of which are having disastrous effects for our collective attention, our ability to deal with anything, never mind something as big as the climate crisis. So I think you're right. Explain to people, this is a systemic problem and it requires a systemic solution. There was a moment this really fell into place for me. So I'd spent those three months off the internet. I had this blissful return of attention. And we talked, you're one of the very, I had a, a non-smartphone and you were one of the few people who had my number. So I was talking about it at the time. And then I came back and very quickly, my attention disintegrated again. And I went to interview this guy called Dr. James Williams, who had worked at the heart of Google and was seeing what they were doing and was horrified and had this moment when he spoke at a tech conference to the people who are designing the kind of things that obsess our kids and, and us. And he said to them, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, please put up your hand now. And not one person put up their hand and he quit. And he said to me, the mistake you've made, Johan, by thinking the solution is just for you personally to abandon your phone and the internet, is it's like thinking the solution to air pollution is for you personally to wear a gas mask. I'm not against gas masks, if I lived in Beijing, I'd wear one, but they're not the solution to air pollution. But it's so interesting to me, Naomi, because you know, you 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 face this struggle all the time in a culture where it's almost like the grammar of thought is to individualize everything, right? Whether it's poverty, race, I mean, just things that are so obviously not individual, right? Um <clears throat> What, what do you find about, it, it's such an uphill battle to persuade people, A, that this isn't a purely individual problem, and B, if it is systemic, that we can deal with it. What do you, how, you obviously confront this all the time. Well, I mean, what you're <laughs> describing is itself a symptom of the crisis in the sense that what mm. cap capitalism tells us that we are all, like what, <laughs> what you were saying earlier, that we're all, that, that there is no such thing as society, that, that, that we are, it's all just indi individuals in our families, as Margaret Thatcher said. And so whenever we're confronted with any kind of systemic problem, people, people want to find individual solutions because they have lost faith in the power of the collective. Um, they don't believe that they can do big things together, right? And this is why a kind of fatalism has set in because now we're no longer really ha having trouble convincing people that the world is screwed. It, you know, when I first started <laughs> publishing books like this, I, that was mostly what I had to do was, was convince people that there was a problem with globalization, that, there, that climate change really was at odds with um, 
in our economic system. Now, what I have to do is convince people that 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 they you know that they should wake up in the morning because they <laughs> are so convinced that 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 we have this systemic crisis. But what they don't believe is that they can do that we can do big things together, right? Uh, so they see the systemic crisis, but they still believe that they are only powers as individuals. And then if that's true, we are screwed, right? Um, so, but I think there's another layer to it, which is that when we, we aren't just trying to connect when we get, go online, we aren't just trying to get information. We're also trying to perform our identities. We're also trying to burnish our personal brands because we've been actually told that we are ourselves the product that we must sell all the time, right? Mm. Um, that, that it, so it isn't only that these tech companies see us as a product to sell to their advertisers and whoever else is interested in their data. It's also that we ourselves see ourselves as products and those two interests intersect, right? So we have to go online to perform our identity, uh, to sell ourselves in the market um, because that's what individuals have become under capitalism. And doing so provides endless data for these companies to sell another kind of product that is us, which is not the same as the product that we're trying to sell, but it's entirely compatible because it brings, puts us online sharing our most intimate, you know, details about our lives, right? You think about what people are doing on Instagram, we're just voluntarily handing over all kinds of data um, uh, by performing our identities. Uh, so yeah, um, the individualism, hyper individualism, I think, is at the it's at the very heart of this crisis, and this intersecting crisis. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Um, well, I, before we move to what we do about it, I I would love for you to talk about this the connections that you see between this. You know, you now have a trilogy, Johan, and it's really <laughs> it's beautiful, and and I think that that you know, if we think about chasing the scream um, and, and then, which is about addiction um, and then followed by lost connections, which is about depression um, and, 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 and other mental health crises. And now, um, and, and now stolen focus, which is about connection. These books build on each other. Um, and, and, I, you know, I see connections between them. I would love to hear how you see the connections, like, and the connective threads, how one led to another. That's so interesting because I, I think I think it's I, I, you know this better than I do, Naomi. It's it's very hard to have insight onto your own process in these things. And in a way, like all writers, I'm sort of slightly afraid of thinking about the insight into it because you don't want to, you know, it feels like. This is a very pretentious metaphor. I was about to say touching a butterfly's wings. How ridiculous the pretentious. Um, but I think what I do see as a connection between them is that they're all about things where when they happen, we we almost always see them as individual problems. Whereas actually, when you look at them, when you understand them, you realize they always occur in a wider context. And the context is almost always more important than the individual. Think about something, at some level we know this because when we hear it, it, it's obviously true. I'll give you an, one fact I could give out millions. When a factory closes in a town, the opioid overdose rate more than doubles over the following three to five years, right? Everyone hearing that knows absolutely why that is, right? And they know that the factory didn't close because it's the fault of the individual worker. That, obviously, that's not the case, right? So we can see this is why the opioid crisis has been described by Dr. So by Professor Ann Case and Professor Angus Dayton as deaths of despair, right? There've been this enormous number of deaths of despair. Um, and you can see how, of course, you could home in on the individual, you could find individual factors in that individual's life. And of course, that's a really important thing to do. I'm in favor of individual psychology, obviously, but to see it in the absence of the wider picture is insane. So I think with all of these things, you know, to say to people, you know, think about where we are with attention. The average American office worker now focuses on only one task for only three minutes. For every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven, there's now a hundred children who've been identified with that problem, right? That is not because there's something wrong with those individual office workers or those individual children. That's because there's been this profound transformation in the society. And it's funny, I used to, with, with Lost Connections, I used to often start explaining this 
with by analogy with obesity. And I stopped doing it because, you know, so I used to say, okay, so the average American has put on 22 pounds since 1970, right? There was almost no obesity in 1970. Now most Americans are overweight or obese. Um, we know that's not because everyone suddenly became greedy or the other stigmatizing things people say about overweight people. We know that's because our food supply system completely changed. We built cities that you can't walk and bike around and we became more stressed, which makes you more comfort eat more. And I stopped saying that in the US because people would just come back and go, yeah, but fat people are lazy. And people would just come back with the most, and uh, people would come back with either highly individual things. They go, but I could lose weight if I wanted to, I'm just lazy. It, you, it's almost like you, you, they've really internalized that fat to right logic so much even something that's obviously social right you didn't build the city you live in you didn't design a food supply system that gives you n almost no option for fresh and nutritious food you didn't design the fact that when you were 18 months old you know more 18 month old children know what the mcdonald's m means they know their own last name you didn't create that right so the analogy broke down because the but i think what does work and i'm really interested in exploring this with you is what in a sense reasoning outward going you think this is an individual problem but look it's a bigger collective problem is is hard but actually when you talk about collective struggles in the past that led to change i find that much more effective because people know the truth of that does that does that i can give some examples if you like but the the does that do you, does that match your experience Naomi? yeah i mean i i, I just i would just add Connecting it with the climate crisis, this is where it truly becomes absurd because I think you can sort of see where if you're talking about addiction or overeating um, or uh, um, depression, something that really seems to play out in the body, right? Um, that it's compatible with an idea that everything is everything is on the individual. But then you realize that as a society, we convinced people for, to talk about climate change for decades as mainly being an issue that you should personally solve by changing your light bulbs or changing, you know, how much you fill the tea kettle by or whatever it is. And it's quite extraordinary that you had huge green groups for a very long time at where their main messaging was, here's this huge global problem, which is obviously systemic in terms of where we get our energy from and how we grow our food. But what we're going to tell you to do is not to take on the fossil fuel companies or the big ag companies, but to personally change your own behavior. So we do this with every issue, no matter how absurd. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's helpful to connect the dots and to help people see, okay, this is a systemic issue. We do this again and again and again. But no, I do think that thinking about um, movements that took issues that were treated as personal pathologies and the civil rights movement uh, has done this because, um, because, because, you know, so-called underachievement, black underachievement was treated, has been treated and is still treated in many circles as um, a, a failure of, you know, a, a failure of the individual, a kind of pathology. If we think about feminism and the way it re-narrativized, you know, postpartum depression, um, you know, the plight of the bored housewife and said, wait a minute, it is not you, you know, it is not your mental health crisis. You may be having a mental health crisis, but it is a it, it's a systemic crisis of the way women are treated in society or the way Black people are treated in society. And that's what social movements do: is they take you know collective uh, um, uh, uh, challenges and crises and and provide a framework where we're able to connect. That doesn't that doesn't um, mean that you aren't facing an individual crisis, but it means that you understand the the connections between what you're facing, what other people are facing. And I, I find myself thinking about the Bernie campaign because I was very involved in, mm. in, in the Sanders campaign. And, and one of the reasons why I threw down for Bernie in the way that I did is because of his, I think, wonderful slogan, not me, us, which was really about going door to door and phone call by phone call and saying to Americans, you think your debt is your personal failing, right? And the whole society has been telling you that, that you screwed up because you can't pay your bills. Um, and in fact, millions upon millions of people are in the same situation. And this was created by a system that is preying on, you know, our, our uh, you know, our, all, of our, all, of, all of our most vulnerable 
uh, um, crises and turning it into profit and maybe healthcare shouldn't be a profit center, right? And let's talk about, about solutions that are systemic. So yeah, I think that, that, that uh, that's a connective tissue that I see in your work, right? That all of these issues were treated as personal failings and you're helping people to see how they are part of systemic crises and to see the interests behind them. Well, I think what's happened is our distress has been depoliticized, right? Explicitly depoliticized. So think about something yeah. as simple yeah. as, you know, now going into the pandemic, um, six out of 10 Americans had less than $500 in savings, right? Because that money has been transferred upwards, right? I mean, the, the, the five heirs to the Walmart fortune who are heirs, they have done nothing to earn it, have more than the bottom 100 million Americans, right? And poor Americans are much more likely to be depressed and anxious. And what do we do? We tell them it's a biological fault in their brains, right? This is not to deny there is some biological contribution to depression, of course, but you can see how this just deep, or think about attention. Our attention has been completely invaded by huge forces. We use technologies that are explicitly designed to hack and invade our attention. We are so stressed and overworked, we sleep an hour less than we did a century ago. We eat food that causes enormous energy spikes and energy crashes, which leave you with brain fog throughout the day. We are exposed to air pollution that causes brain inflammation, that damages your ability to focus and pay attention. We are chronically stressed, which flips us into vigilance and hypervigilance. All these things, and then even someone like me, who I'd like to think is in the upper end of knowing about social causes, when I couldn't focus, I thought, damn it, why isn't your willpower good enough, right? So it, it, it can feel like, it's funny, it's an analogy I use in the book, that paying deep focus feels like running up a down escalator at the moment. But in a way, explaining there are social causes of problems feels like running up a down escalator in this culture as well. And I think you're right that the what works, the analogies you used are really important. The analogy that I, I find helps me most is about partly I'm gay so the gay rights struggle obviously is very important to me but actually I think a lot about my grandmothers you know um as you know I really loved my grandmothers um they were amazing women and and I think about their lives when they were the age I am now so my grandmothers were the age I am now in 1963 and one of them was a working class Scottish woman living in what in the U.S. they call a housing project and the other one was a Swiss peasant woman living in a in a wooden hut on the side of a mountain they had both left school when they were 13 even though the men in their family went on much longer because no one gave a shit about girls learning anything my, my Swiss grandmother loved to paint and draw they told her to shut up and get into the kitchen and when they were the age I am now they were not allowed to have bank accounts in their own names because they were married women um they were they, their husbands could legally rape them um as men could legally rape their wives everywhere in the world in 1963 their husbands could in practice legally beat, beat the hell out of them because the police never intervened in domestic violence. And I know it's very annoying for a man to mansplain this, but, and I know we still have a huge amount more to go and we're facing an enormous backlash on these, some of these issues, but I think about their lives and then I think about my grandmother's, my, my niece's life, who's 17. You know, she loves to draw and paint. She never knew my grandmother. When she started to draw and paint, no one said, get into the kitchen. We said, let's start looking up art schools, right? And, and I really don't want to underestimate how much further we have to go to achieve liberation for women at, at all. There's a huge amount more to do when we may be about to face a terrible back, a terrible regression with losing Roe versus Wade. But, but I think about that, that, that journey. And I think in a way where we are now on attention is where my grandmothers were in 1963 in one sense, in that my grandmother's lives were profoundly disfigured by misogyny and male supremacy, right? but they had no feminist consciousness. There hadn't been a feminist movement. They, they just saw that as, they hated it, but they thought that was the way of the world. They lamented it the way I might, you know, if I'd been born with a club foot, I might just lament that I've got a club foot, right? That they didn't see it as anything to which there was a solution. And then of course the generation of women emerging at that time politicized it and explained to people, no, it doesn't have to be this way. And I feel at the moment with the tension where we are is, is at that point where you go, this thing you think is just a lamentable fact about the world is a highly constructed product of a social system that does not have to be this way. So it's about explaining that it's a, it's a political product in the what deepest sense, a social product, and then giving people a sense of political agency. And the second bit is even more important because a lot of people will go with you on this as a product of the social thing, and then they just go, well, then we're really screwed. 
because we can't even give insulin to people with diabetes in this country, never mind, you know, solve these big problems. And I try and go, when they say that, however powerful big tech or the food industry and these other factors are, they're not a hundredth as powerful as men were in 1963, when my grandmothers were the age I am now. Men controlled every country, every company, every police force, and, and they had controlled them forever, as long as they'd existed, apart from a few hereditary monarchs. Um, and, and those women did not give up. They got up and they they fought and there's still a long way to go. But they, they made these incredible. I think it'd be very hard for anyone to deny that women. My niece is not much better off than my grandmother's were. Um, and that you could, could only be explained through a social struggle. Right. Um, what, what do you think as I say that, Naomi? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that those analogies are important. And I think that the kinds of movements that we need are a kind of combination between those movements that that told different stories about who people are, right? Mm. Um, and, and we've mentioned some of those movements, and also movements that 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 reclaimed infrastructure, right? Mm. Um, because 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 yes, we, we need to we, we need we need to have a right to our attention and a right to focus, but we also. I think have a right to the infrastructure that is so essential to our lives now, right? And has become more essential um, during the pandemic. Um, so we have a right to a digital commons and, and you get into this in the book. And I think that the analogies for that kind of movement are more like the decolonial struggles um, you know, in, in the global South, I think it's, it's Chile reclaiming their copper mines. It's, it's Iran reclaiming their oil. Um, it, and, and, there, and, and those are movements that, that said, you know, this is too, this is infrastructure that is too essential. Um, and, 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 and we collectively have a right to it. I mean, the, the, the fight for public schools is another one, the fight for, um, the fight for, 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 for public airwaves is another one. So I think that, yes, I think that, that, that those sort of individual civil rights struggles um, uh, are, are, are really important, but so are the reclaiming the infrastructure movements. Um, so and we want to bring some more people into this conversation. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. no, those, what were you going to say? <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's such a good point you just made. Yeah. Well, thank you both, Johan and Naomi, for such an incredible and enlightening chat. So I would love to dive into some attendees' questions for both of you. So the first is, what are the connections between focus and empathy? I feel like our capacity for empathy has suffered terribly during recent years, and especially during the pandemic. And I'm wondering if that also correlates with focus and in what ways? You know, you've been thinking about this, Naomi, as well. Do you want to go first? There you go. So um, another Canadian taught me a lot about this actually. So empathy is itself a form of focus, right? So if, if focus breaks down, empathy breaks down because empathy is about following us. It's about imagining being another person, imagining their story, engaging deeply with their story. So an individual who can't focus is obviously gonna struggle with empathy. But there was a really interesting Canadian called Professor Raymond Marr, who I interviewed a lot in Toronto, who's done all this really interesting research that shows that, so they had a hypothesis, which they weren't sure would be, borne out that obviously when you read a novel you immerse yourself in the inner life of another person Naomi and I were just talking offline about a writer we absolutely love Richard Powers and um so Professor Ma's thesis was okay well maybe reading novels is like an empathy gym maybe people who read more fiction actually are better at empathizing with people uh you know when they're not reading books novels and I go into the details how but I think he proved pretty conclusively that he was right, that, that if you simulate other, in fact, a novel is a much better form of virtual reality than anything we call virtual reality machines. Mm -hmm. um, and that reading novels does in fact boost your, your empathy. And of course, reading a novel requires deep focus, right? It's one of the things people have really struggled to do in recent years. There's been an enormous fall in, in the reading of fiction. This is the first time in the history of the American Republic that in any given year, a majority of people don't read a single book. Um, so I think, I mean, that's obviously one of many, many forms, but I think, yeah, focus and empathy, I mean, I said empathy is the most precious form of focus. 
And I would say, take care what technologies you expose yourself to, because over time your consciousness will come to resemble those technologies. If you want to have an inner life that sounds like Twitter, A, I'll give you the number for a psychiatrist, B, expose yourself to Twitter. If you wanna have a consciousness that is like that of a novel, warm, empathetic, then expose yourself to more novels. Now I'm aware that's, a, that's an individual change and there's big systemic changes we've got to argue for as well. But does, does that ring true to you, Naomi? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I was thinking about, this is a, a big theme in, in Richard Powers' book, new book, The Wilderment, because they build an empathy machine. <laughs> but in his interviews about, about, about the novel, he's, he, he, he confesses that he believes that there is no better empathy, empathy machine than a novel. Uh, and that mm. he was hoping that he had built one um, uh, oh. with this book um, and, and with his other books. So yeah, I, I really do. Um, I would do agree. And I, I do find myself thinking about my own son and his tablet time, <laughs> as we call it, tablet time. <laughs> um, but uh, but, you know, I think documentaries also um, can do some of that. Yeah. I don't think it's only novels. I think it's sure. anything that that demands attention from us. And and I've been struck listening to some of the interviews that you've been doing with people on television where they're sort of confessing that they can't read a book, that they can't even watch a film. Um, and I think anything we give our attention to, um, it can be the natural world, it can be a walk. I think any kind of attention, and this it, it, um, is an exercise in empathy. I think it's not only other humans that mm -hmm. are deserving of our empathy. I think it's the non-human world as well. Um, and, and, it, and, and attention is how we activate that, that muscle. And if we don't use it, then it atrophies. And yeah, yeah explains That's a lot about what's going on right now. Oh, I think my, yeah, no. uh, I have a visitor. Johan, oh. has anything changed in your day-to-day -day life since doing the research for and, and writing this book? And can you describe that change for us? Oh God, so many things. I, um, it's in the other room where I'd show it to you guys, but I have, I sent one to Naomi, I think as well. I have a K safe, which is a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, you turn the dial at the top and it imprisons your phone for between anything between five minutes and a whole day. Um, I've got freedom installed on my laptop, cuts me off from the internet. I use that for four hours a day. I will not sit down with my boyfriend and watch a film unless we both imprison our phones. I won't have my friends around for dinner unless they agree to put their phone in the phone jail. And you can see how people really struggle with it at first, but the pleasures of focus, and looking into people's eyes and deeply engaging are so much greater than the shitty pleasures of seeing a notification that someone retweeted you. I mean, that's one of, I go through dozens of changes that I've made in my own life in the book, but I'm also conscious as I say that, it comes back to that tension that Naomi was getting at, which is, and that was there in that first draft of the book that Naomi completely rightly helped me to reframe. You know, 35% of people feel they can never stop checking their phone or, or checking their email because their boss could message them at any time of the day or night. And if they don't answer, they're going to be in trouble. I can give someone in that position all the lovely self-help lectures I like about case safes and sleeping more and the benefit. It's an insult to them. It's like going up to a homeless person in the street and saying, hey, buddy, you know what would make you feel much better if you went into that restaurant and had a really nice steak? Have you thought about that? It's, it's insulting to people. Um, uh, where, where, whereas, which is why in France, they introduced what's called a right to disconnect, which is where um, uh, every worker has two rights. You have a right to a written, written work hours, defined work hours, and you have the right to not have to answer your phone outside work hours. And employers get fined 70,000 euros if they break that rule. That's something we can all fight for. I've just realized my battery's low. So while Naomi answers this, I'm just gonna say something interesting. I'm gonna run and grab my charger, sorry about that. <laughs> Naomi, for you, as a yeah. longtime activist, have you noticed people's attention when it comes to political causes, you know, declining over the past two decades? And has that had any noticeable effect on the effectiveness of, of movements? Whew, that's a big question. Um, I... I, I mean, I want to say that I also, I, I have, I, yes, I have noticed 
a decline and a, and a, and a I think it isn't just about people's attention. It's also the ways in which kind of NGOs cater to a certain kind of, um, uh, you know, click, I mean, clicktivism, but this idea of like, here's the one thing you can do that will make all the difference. And it's not a model of here's the kind of sustained political education that we need to do to come up with a plan that has multiple stages and we're kind of committing to each other that we're gonna be in this for the long run, which is the way movements used to work, right? Um, political education was a huge part of them. Um, and, and having a longer time frame than just winning a sort of very finite campaign that then mm. is used for list building. We did it, we won. Mm. I mean, we, we've all been, you know, we're all on those lists. You did it, now send us more money. Um, you know, and <laughs> post it to social media. It's so much of, of organizing has become just list building. Um, and so if that's the goal, then you have to, um, you, you have to have narrower uh, um, campaigns, right? That are gonna be winnable in a time frame that you'll then be able to brag and then use, right? It, the kinds of changes that we're talking about can't be won by one NGO. They can only be won by large intersectional uh, um, social movements that nobody's gonna be allowed to take credit for on their own. So it challenges the whole business model. Like it isn't just social media companies that have a business model. NGOs have business models too. And that, that militates against the kind of collective action that, that is, um, you know, there's the individualism of the individual, but there's also the individualism of a kind of, of, of an institution, of an organization mm -hmm. that, get, that, that gets pitted against each other. But that said, I wanna say that I think there's been an amazing wave of uh, particularly younger activists taking it upon themselves to start reading groups, to take their own political education more seriously, to really read up. And I, I'm really impressed by that. Um, so, yeah. So interesting about what you're saying, Naomi, because that's so interesting about, I thought one of the most amazing parts of your book, No Is Not Enough, which if people haven't read it, I really recommend. It was like all of Naomi's books, incredibly prophetic. You have this bit, it was very early in the Trump era. You have this part that you call, I think, saying like fighting your inner Trump, because narcissism is also a corruption of attention. It's where attention is turned inwards entirely onto the individual and their own ego. And there's been that that's also an attention. I mean, it's not just an attention problem, obviously, but that's an attention problem that's hugely risen. And one of the other tragedies of these environments that we're talking about is that they inculcate narcissism, right? I can feel myself becoming much more narcissistic on the very rare occasions I log into to Twitter because I mean, I have someone who I, I send my tweets to someone who does them for me because I don't I can't bear to look at it. And because I can feel it gives you the impression that everyone's talking about you, right? Mm -hmm. You're being argued about, you're being debated. It, it, it's horrendous. It puts you into this, even when it's really nice, it, it, puts, it throws you into this form of egotism where you're constantly thinking about, you know, managing how people think about you. you know, the best piece of advice I was ever given was me and Amy have a great mutual friend, a wonderful, one of the best people in the world, V, formerly known as Eve Ensler. She said to me years ago, V said to me, best advice, I think this might be the best advice I've ever been given. She said, Johan, it's not your job to manage how other people talk and think about you. <laughs> Just do your work. Do your work, do it as well as you can, and then get on with more work. Don't worry about all this shit. And it was such an enlightening, you know, it's the opposite of narcissism, right? To think that way. Just let, let people think what they're going to think. Just do your work. But that the, the, the environment when really militates against that. But you're right, Naomi. It's really encouraging that there are so many people resisting that. Naomi and I first met in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Summit. And I had this real, when it was the anniversary not so long ago, um, I suddenly had this realization because the, the Copenhagen Climate Summit felt like the end of the world for various reasons we can talk about. It was the moment when the whole world was meant to come together to deal with global warming. And that last night, I remember me and Naomi walking out into the snow and it just being like a hellscape, realizing they had not made any deal. And I texted Naomi on the anniversary and said, Greta was six years old that day, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these amazing young people. So you're, you're totally right. There's also a subculture of completely incredible forms of deep attention and, 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 and resistance that are so inspiring to see so these are not all in company machineries that destroy everyone they are you know there are pockets that are that are finding incredibly fertile ground for fighting back on all sorts of things and i think it's, it's worth um 
just observing that these that this thing we call social media is an, is an eavesdropping machine, right? Um, mm. And you know, when I wrote my first book, when I wrote No Logo, I had no way of knowing what random people thought about me. I, you know, there was <laughs> the, the, the technology was not available to me. You know, somebody would have had to make an effort to tell me, um, and and so that in itself weeded out. You, you know, who, who would make that kind of an effort. They had to care, care a fair bit, you know, to, to get my email address and write me and so on. Um, and so it was only when we started to have comments under articles and then eventually social media where we were sort of invited to eavesdrop on, on you know, ra random conversations. I mean, people have a right to their random conversations. The question is, do, should we be listening? <laughs> um, and this idea that there's a little bell that you're supposed to click before you even find out what the news is, but first find out what people are saying about you is, is that that's, that's structural, that's a decision. Um, and it's really reshaped <laughs> um, how, we, how we interact with each other and what we see as important. Yeah. So our last question actually plays perfectly off of that. We have so many people in the Q&A saying, I'm an artist, I need to have social media to be able to market my work, but it takes away from my creativity, or should I take a break from the internet? So <laughs> I want to ask you both, you know, what single digital habit or change could most significantly increase someone's well-being or reduce their stress? you know, or they're tied together, perhaps. And Naomi, off to you. <laughs> I'll throw this on to you first. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, I think we all use it and Johan uses it and, and I use it. And it's this tension of, are you using it or is it using you? Um, <laughs> and so I think having the discipline to prioritize what you want to use it for. Um, and then if you can do it, if you it, it, using tools like Freedom, so that it's only available to you for say an hour a day, um, that and you organize your time. Um, maybe don't use your best hours for it. If you're an artist and you know that you work best in the morning, then save your morning brain for your art and think about when you have your energy dip and make that your social media hour. <laughs> um, but program it and lock yourself out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't follow this advice all the time, but I don't have, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't have a personal Facebook account. I don't have an Instagram account. I use Twitter. It's not on my phone. It's not on my laptop. It's sorry. It is on my laptop, but it's not on my writing computer, which is a desktop. Um, so, yeah. What was the brilliant thing you said about Instagram, Naomi? Someone suggested you go on Instagram. What did you say? Do you remember this? I think you said something like- I called I've it already the been... algorithm of envy. Yeah, you said I've already been infected with anger. I don't want to be infected with envy as well, right? That was such a brilliant case against <laughs> against Instagram. The, um, I mean, one of the most enlightening things about my last book, Lost Connections, the reaction on Instagram, was I cannot tell you how many people with huge followings on Instagram, mostly models, quite a lot of porn stars. Um, sadly, all women, the gay porn stars, didn't contact me. Um, and, and um, you know, like people who look having such great lives on Instagram, how many of them private messaged me saying, I watched your TED talk, I'm reading your book, I'm suicidal, right? And it was really interesting clicking over from their messages of despair to their Instagram page where three minutes before they'd sent me this message saying they were suicidal, there's this, you know, glowing, gorgeous picture of them. Um, in terms of the advice I would give artists, I would give a few, but I would actually start with a, a quite challenging one. I think you're probably kidding yourself that you need to be on this stuff. I think if you looked at how many of my books or Naomi's books are sold through Twitter, for example, I bet as a percentage, it's infinitesimal. It's really small, right? Um, actually, I tell myself I'm on it because I want to sell my books. The truth is, I think it gives me an ego boost. I think I see, oh, how many people follow me? I think that's why I do it. If I'm really ruthlessly honest with myself, I'm not saying there's no role of book promotion, um, but I think interrogate painfully how much of it is what you need to do. I would say, even if you then conclude you need to do it, I take half the year completely off and I, I do a form of pre-commitment. So I announced that I'm taking three months off because I'll look like an absolute fool if I suddenly pop up a week later. Mm -hmm. And I get my friend Lizzie to change my password so I can't crack in the middle of the night. 
Um, and I would say just try announcing, start small, just announce you're gonna be off for th two weeks, right? Two weeks is nothing, right? What were you doing two weeks ago today? Won't seem so different to what you're doing now, right? Just start with two weeks and see if you feel any different. And you'll go through a painful period of withdrawal. I talk about this obviously in the book. You'll go through a painful period of withdrawal at first, but the, the rewards of being able to think deeply are so much greater than the shitty rewards of re likes and retweets and seeing how many followers you've got. So I would say both ends, interrogate, interrogate how much you really need to be there. I'm not disputing there, maybe photographers I know, it is actually really important being on Instagram. That's basically your portfolio now. I'm not disputing, I don't know which form of art you, you do. But I would say really think about that because I think you may be kidding yourself. And if I'm honest with myself, because I've been considering just deleting it all, it, it, it doesn't enrich my life. I don't like it. Um, and I have an extremely, I treat it like Chernobyl, right? <laughs> I send my tweets to my friend. She posts them on the page. I almost never look. I, you know, I deliberately have very careful firewalls. Like I've been in a new relationship the last uh, four or five months. And I had to say to him very early on, stop reading about me on social media because I can hear, I don't want to sound like Princess Diana, there's three of us in this marriage. But it was a weird thing where I thought, oh, there's, there's three people here. There's me. There's you, and then there's the public creation of me, which isn't me, right? Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't, what I project out into the world, that isn't me, and what people say about me isn't me. And he wasn't telling me horrible things, but he was just saying, oh, someone made this joke, an affectionate joke. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to be in a, a, a relationship with you, me, and my public self. I want to just be in a relationship with you, right? Um, so I think having all these firewalls and interrogating how it makes you feel to be in this, in this world um, is really important. And if I was following my own advice, I would just delete this shit. And I, I'm seriously considering it because it's just, it's just, it, it, it's not that important for book promotion and it is degrading of everything else, I think. Maybe I've got a very negative view of it. I don't know. But, no, uh, I appreciate this actionable advice. I'm definitely going to tell my friend to change my passwords. Um, so oh, thank you both. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we have for our chat. But thank you to all the attendees for joining us today and for supporting Stolen Focus. You can oh, find thanks, links. Abby. Oh, I well, really appreciate thank you. you doing this. Thank and you I just, so can much. Can I just say one thing before you do the links? I just want to say a thank you to you. Thank you to everyone who pre ordered the book. I'm so grateful. I want to particularly say thank you to Naomi because, as you can all tell, Naomi is the most brilliant friend to have just as a human being. And also, when you're trying to think through a difficult subject, Naomi is very good at getting me to see how contaminated I've been by our culture and how I need to see things in a bigger way. And I'm really deeply grateful to Amy because I know that my, my book, anything good about it, it is so much better because of the conversations I had with Naomi and because of all the work from her I absorbed before that, which taught me and so many millions of other people to think in a much deeper and richer and more nuanced way. So Naomi, I'm so grateful to you for doing this event and I'm so grateful to you all the time. Thank you. That is way too lavish, Johan. And I just want to congratulate you on another brilliant book and on helping so many people, because that is what it's really about. Um, and this book is a gift, as your earlier books have been. And it's tremendously generous. And I hope it really helps people. And I know it already is. So thank you so much. Yes, I echo that gratitude for both of you being here. And this book really is incredible. And I'm really glad that it's out in the world. So you can find some links in our chat to follow along on social media, you know, when you're not on your break. And <laughs> if you like this book or you think someone else in your life would benefit from its message, tell a friend, leave a review online. Um, that's the best way to help other people find Stolen Focus. So thank you so much, Johan and Naomi, for joining us today. And thank you all for attending. Hooray. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.